thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will be doing a radio show for all of you from the impact of radio on our lives. And that is a non-credit course that we offer here um, Monday afternoons. So thank you all for coming, and we really appreciate your support because we all have been working very hard to put this together for you, and it should be a lot of fun. Um, we do have complimentary refreshments after the show on the table over there. And I would ask now that you take a moment to please silence all your cell phones so it doesn't interrupt the actor's lovely work. So I'll give you just a minute to do that. And if you have any candies, cough drops, anything that's in wrappers, please do that now as well. And thank you so yeah. much for joining us. On with the show. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You know that old question, what were you doing on such and such a day? Conjure up a photographic image of yourself or perhaps somebody in your family somewhere in the 30s, 40s, or perhaps the early 50s. Different impressions may come back to you. How about the 30s? Maybe you heard the word depression too often. Maybe the terms make do, leftovers, and hand-me-downs meant something to you. In the early 40s, maybe somebody in your family received a draft notice. Maybe you played stickball on the curb. Or the early 50s, maybe the telephone was hooked up to a party line and you listened for three rings for your household. And then maybe one day, somebody down the street bought a television set with a screen about as big as a postcard and a magnifying glass to go in front of it. <laughs> or, wait, look at the background of those images in your mind. In every one of them, there is something, oh, you can see it on the kitchen counter next to the Wonder Bread. Or wait, there it is. You're sitting on your front porch glider and you can just make it out through the screen window. Or there it is again, right opposite the sofa in the living room with a lace doily on top and a lovingly polished radio console with a cloth-covered speaker and a very sensitive dial. So to ask the question again, what were you doing on such and such a day decades ago? There may be a common answer for all of us. We were listening to the radio. This afternoon you're in for a special treat an opportunity to laugh together, to transcend time. You are fortunate enough to be in the audience of a radio studio where some of those wonderful programs you listen to at home are being beamed across the country. A live radio broadcast of some of your favorite comedies. So welcome to station KMCC. Please remember that you represent our listeners out there across America. Hmm. Let's try out that applause. Without further ado, let's journey backward in time. Let's step for a moment in for the moment for the Zigfield Theaters on the first night of the Follies of 1931 and listen to one of the funniest comedians who ever appeared under the auspices of Zigfield, the little Jack Pearl himself in person. Hello, Jack. Hello, Cliff. I want to ask you something. What? Why is it I'm always dizzy when I look out a high window? Well, Chuck, uh, that's easily explained. You see the brain, that is the cerebrum cerebellum, mm -hmm. 
is composed of several different compartments. Is that so? Yes. Now, one of those compartments controls the equilibrium. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Now, now you see, un unless on this, this is highly sensitive. The equilibrium is nil. <gasps> Please. In other words, you're suffering from an altitude complex. Goodness. Uh, I made myself clear. Yeah, but why is it I'm dizzy when I look out of a high window? I take back what I said about your being dizzy. You're just dumb, that's it. Who's dumb? <laughs> You're dumb. Now listen, Mr. Schmad, Alex, I never was in school so long I live. I will bet you five dollars. Do you hear? Yes, I hear. I will bet you five dollars, mit all your schmattness, I could answer my question where you could not answer yours. Now, what do you think of that? Uh, just let me understand. You want to wager five dollars that you can answer your question and I can't answer mine? Exactly my words. Uh, all right, the bet's on. All right. Have you got five dollars with you? Yes, I think so. Well, if you win, you'll trust me, huh? <laughs> okay. Look, uh, uh, look, uh, did, you, uh, did you have a vas in the boots? Did I what? Don't, don't you hear good? Uh, uh, yes, I hear you. I don't understand you. Did you ever boss in the woods? Oh, in the woods? Yeah. Uh, yeah, many times. Oh, you boss. You... Well, then you boss in the woods. Did you ever see holes? Did I ever see what? Hmm, why did I ever meet you? Did you, did you ever see holes? Oh, holes. Well, what kind of holes? Oh, well, I would say a rabbit holes. What kind of holes? A rabbit holes. Oh, rabbit holes. I've seen rabbit holes. Do you know? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I understand. <laughs> Do you know how the rabbit makes that hole without leaving any dirt around it? Do I know how the rabbit makes the hole without leaving any dirt around it? Exactly. Uh, well, that's a very difficult question. I must admit I can't answer that. Can you? That is my question, and I must answer that one. They start from the bottom, and they dig up. Uh, and I never was in school so long as I live. I have you now. But uh, how does the rabbit get to the bottom in order to dig the top? Ha! Ha! That is your question. <laughs> you answer it. Uh, <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, and now on with the show. You know, friendship is a precious thing, and I have a friend I dearly love. My friend, Irma. How can I describe her? Physically, she's very attractive. Mentally, she's, well, as a famous philosopher once said, knowledge can be a dangerous weapon. Apply that to Irma, and you have a pretty blonde eating you with a feather. Let me give you an example. The other day, I said to Irma, Irma, how are you making out with that Christmas list of yours? Not so good. I think I'll try it once more. Now, let's see. $8 plus 14 plus 12 plus 7 makes 10. 10? Are you sure? Well, it has to. That's all the money I have. <laughs> Look, Irma, we discussed this a couple of weeks ago, and I told you we're cutting down on all gifts. Well, I know, Jane. But look at this article in the paper. What article? This one. This one here. It says you can earn more income in your spare time. Let me see. Many of our greatest people have many men on the side by using their ingenuity. You too can augment your fortune if in your spare time you will sell Mother Wilson's mechanical coffee maker with the revolving percolator. Remember our slogan, it flips while it drips? You want to buy one, Jane? Now look, Irma, you are not participating in any more of these get-rich schemes. Look, Jane, I know, I know, 
But if I let that one failure get me down, I will never get anywhere. A person has to have ambition, drive, you know, the old American spirit. Come in. It's only me, Professor Kapotkin. Hello, Jenny and Emma. Guess what, gals? Mrs. O'Reilly is buttering me up, so I'll give her a nice gift. She has already redecorated my room. Well, I think it's wonderful of Mrs. O'Reilly to be filled with the holiday spirit. And I'm in the same mood. That's why I want to make extra money for the holiday. Well, Emma, if you want to make extra money, why don't you take a job in a department store? They're always looking for sales girls about this time. She tried it last year. No good? She got stuck on the escalator for two days. <laughs> well, the escalator was going down, and I wanted to go up. So I stood there waiting for the light to change. <laughs> oh, Irma, please, you don't need any extra money for gifts. The people who love you will still love you, regardless of what you give them. Look at me. At first, I was going to fill one of Mrs. O'Reilly's stockings with candy and little presents. But when I figured out the expense of hiring a dump truck and a claim, I gave it up. It takes two to tango, two to tango, two to really get the feeling of romance. It takes two to tango, two to tango, do the friends of love. Hello, can you at home? Come in, Mrs. O'Reilly. Hello, girls. You look troubled, Irma, darling. What's wrong? I need money, Mrs. O'Reilly. Could you lend me $20 until New Year's? I'm sorry, Irma, darling, but I have a new singing teacher, and I have to pay you more money. Is he any good? Oh, yes. He gave me a gargle, and now I'm getting wonderful results with it. What did he recommend? Arsenic? What, you weather-beaten old corkscrew? I've seen better physiques on old chicken bones. Is that so? Well, let me tell you a thing. Please, or please, let's not have any more yelling. I have to think about what to do. What's troubling you, Irma, dear? She's trying to figure out a way of making some extra money for Christmas. There should be lots of ways of making some extra money. I remember when I was a little girl, we used to go from door to door on Christmas and sell mistletoe. When you were a girl? I didn't know caves had doors. Professor, I'm warning you. Irma, speaking of making money, you and I better get to work or we'll both be looking for jobs. All right, Jane, and I'm going to keep my eyes open for every chance to make extra money. Miss Peterson? Miss Peterson, would you come into my office? Just a moment. I'll see if she's in. What? She's in right this way, please, Mr. Clyde. Miss Peterson is here. What on earth is going on here? I'm being a receptionist. What for? I need the extra work for Christmas. That's impossible. Do you think I'd be crazy enough to hire two of you to do that work? <laughs> now, let's get started. OK, Chief. What do you want me to do, pal? Miss Peterson, <laughs> stop leaning on my shoulder and talking in my ear. Sure, pal. Will you please tell me what it's supposed to be doing? I'm being very confidential. I hear a confidential secretary gets more money. <laughs> they do, huh? Well, confidentially, you're getting a cut. I am? Why? All on account of you, I still have to pay the hospital for the damages done to Miss Wilkins, our bookkeeper. OK. I don't understand. Well, remember when you wanted to get the ledger down off the top shelf when I told you Miss Wilkins would get you a little stand? I did not tell you to stand on Miss Wilkins. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, will you take a letter? Okay, I'm ready. To Robert Malone, National Dairy Company. Uh, uh, dear Bob, I'm sorry I shall have to cancel our bridge date for next week at the Robertsons, since they had a falling out. May I suggest lunch at Farino's next week? Regards to your wife, sincerely, Milton J. Clark. Got it. Read it back. To the Natural Derelict Company. Not <laughs> derelict. Derek. Dear Bob, in regard to your wife's bridge falling out. Stop, uh, or I'll shoot. <laughs> Don't you say another word. Dear Bob, in regard to your wife's bridge falling out, I suggest she eat Farina for lunch. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> 
Hello, Hodges. Did you deliver that summons already? I couldn't do it, Mr. Clyde. I chased that guy all over that department store, and believe you me, it was murder. I can't find him anywhere. Now, see here, Hodges. I don't pay you to hear excuses. That summons must be served. Murdoch's presence in court is vital to this case. Mr. Clyde, I haven't quit on any jobs before, but you can't find a guy who's doing part-time work in a department store a week before Christmas. But this is vital, and I'll double the fee to $10 under the circumstances. $10? I want you to comb Lacey's from top to bottom until you find Murdoch. I'm sorry, Mr. Clyde. I've... I've got too much respect for my health. You'll have to get someone else. So long. How do you like that? Oh, well. Guess I'll just have to serve that summons myself. Why don't you give me the job, Mr. Klein? Please, Mr. Klein, give me a chance. Forget it. Give me one reason why I can't do it. Number one, there's more dictation. Uh, number two, there's uh, uh, letters to type it. And uh, three, well... All right. You can deliver the summons, but don't do anything drastic. Oh, thank you, Mr. Klein. And don't worry, I'll find that man just as sure as Dr. Stanley found Dr. Jekyll. <laughs> <laughs> well, Irma just called me and told me she's at Lacey's department store looking for someone named Silas Murdoch. Turns out she's going to deliver a summons to him. I called Al. And now Al is down there looking for her. I have a feeling that after today, Lacey's will be glad to tear their building down and become a parking lot. Bound apartment. What? A little slower, please. You've lost your dog. A miniature French poodle with a plaid ribbon tied in a bow on his tail. Red nail polish, a diamond collar with gold license, and he answers to the name of Irving. <laughs> yes, madam, we'll see what we can do. Goodbye. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Miss Wilkins. Have you lost something? Yeah, my chicken. <laughs> Sorry. All I have is a poodle. No, I'm looking for my girlfriend. Understand you have it here? Oh, yes. I think that's her sitting. Chicken! Hi, Al. Oh, I'm so glad you found me. I was lost. Come on, Chicken. I want to talk to you. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Irma, I want to ask you a question. What is it, Al? Why do you keep disturbing me when I have important matters to attend to? Important matters? What were you doing? I was sleeping. Is that important? I should say so. With this new administration coming in, i got to be rested up in case they call me <clears throat> for a position in the cabinet. Is that why you're still wearing your I Like Ike button? Oh, I should... Um, Partly that, and partly because my suspenders broke. Now, what are you doing down here in the first place? Well, there's a Mr. Silas Murdoch who works here part-time, and Mr. Clyde is paying me $10 to deliver this summons to him. So? While I was walking through the store, I saw a sign saying, Young ladies wanted to demonstrate cosmetics. And I can make more money doing that, especially if you deliver the summons for me. I'm always being called on to make sacrifices. All right, chicken, hand me the summons. Thank you, Al. Now, how about taking me to dinner tonight after work? Oh, gee, shucks. I'm sorry, chicken, but it's against my bylaws. <laughs> bylaws? Yeah, you've heard of the Brotherhood of Moose? Yes. I just joined a new lodge, the Brotherhood of the Arctic Sea. We eat only every six months. Oh, well, if it's for something so important and patriotic like that, I better get going. What time is it, Al? Oh, I don't know. It must be a clock around here somewhere. Oh, I see one over there, uh, over that door. It's five, four, three, two, one. Oh, my, how time flies backward. <laughs> Chicken, that's the elevator coming down. See you later. Yes, I'll have Hello, ladies. 
Ladies, ladies, ladies. As you can see, Madam Kronkmeyer's cleansing cream not only freshens the skin, but it gets into every pore and says, my, there's work to be done here. As you see, Madam Kronkmeyer's is the only cleaning cream which contains stoilium and the wonder chemical that resu results from frosting steel wool with lanolin. <laughs> Ladies, don't let your complexion go to the dogs. Use Madame Kronkmeyer's cream and make your skin feel wonderful. Who will have the first jar? Only 98 cents. You're crazy if you don't buy it because you can return it if you don't like it. Pardon me. Yes. I'm Irma Peterson. I was sent over to relieve you. Oh, thank goodness. Business has been so good, I'm just about beat. Have you memorized the spiel? Oh, sure. I just read it through once, and I know it by heart as they say verboten. Oh, good. Then take over. I'll just stand by to see how you do. Really, it isn't necessary, but if you insist, all right, ladies, step right up. Madam Kronkmeyer's cream is the only cream that contains the secret formula, skin. What? <laughs> Don't forget, it contains linoleum. <laughs> it's also good for the paws, so I guess if dogs can use it, it's good enough for you. Miss Peterson. Buy Madam Kronkmeyer's and have skin like steel wool. Miss Peterson. <laughs> Do you see what it says on the jar? Vanish. That's right, and hurry up. <laughs> oh, please. I need the extra money so badly. You're through. Go to the personnel department and tell them you're through. How do you do, madam? Is this the tropical fish department? I have been assigned here. Oh, really? Well, nothing's gone right today. Now, what are my duties? Where do I stand? You see this tropical fish aquarium? Oh, wait, I'll get my galoshes. No! You don't stand in there? <laughs> really. Now, let's see what you have to know. To begin with, all the prices for the tropical fish are listed on the aquarium. You'll find the nets over there. When someone wants a fish, you scoop it out, place it in one of those cartons filled with water, and take it in the back room and gift wrap it. Oh, anyone can do that. Well, let me see you in action. Here comes a customer. How do you do? What can I do for you? I would like some goldfish. Yes, madam. Do you want these? These are 40 cents, and these are 80 cents. Well, the 80 cent ones don't look much larger. Why are they so expensive? Well, the others are gold-plated. These are, <laughs> these are solid gold. How am I doing this, Hawkins? Hmm. Well, it's Lacey's store. Let them worry. Now, is there anything else you would like, madam? Well, yes. Have you any angel fish? Yes, here they are, $10 a pair. I would like one male and one female. Oh, that's nice, uh, Miss Hawkins. How do you tell the male from the female? Well, generally, the male chases the female. That's not necessarily so. I have a girlfriend, Amber Lipscott, and she chases the fellas like mad. <laughs> well, these are fish. They have more character. <laughs> now, in that aquarium is a male and a female. All right. Anything else, madam? Uh, no, thank you. That'll be all. If you wait just a moment, I'll go in the back room and gift wrap them. Is there anything else you wish, madam? Uh, no, nothing. But your sales lady has a lovely personality. Yes. At first I was a little worried about her. She didn't seem too intelligent. But now I think she's caught on. <sighs> well, here we are. It was a bit of work, but now it's done. Let me know how they taste. What? No. Uh, what? You're not supposed to fillet them. Get out of here. Get out of here. I'll thank you to turn in your scoop net. Please, Miss Hawkins, I need the money. I'm not interested. Take your troubles to the personnel office. All right. Gee, they're getting to know me real well. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. O'Reilly and Professor. What are you doing here at Lacey's? Oh, hello.
Hello, Jane. We're doing a little Christmas shopping. Janie, what are you doing here? Well, I've been looking for Irma. They keep telling me she's in a different department. And every time I get there, she's been fired. <laughs> well, where is she working now? I haven't the least idea. Get out of this department, young lady! You're fired! <laughs> oh, I've got an idea. Oh, Irma, we're over here. Oh, Jane, this has been a terrible day. I just, I've been fired again. Hello, Professor and Mrs. O'Reilly. Hello, Irma. Where were you working? We did hear a bit of commotion. Was that you, dearie? I was in the furniture department. I was demonstrating a mattress and I fell asleep. Mm -hmm. Look, Irma, what about that summons you were going to serve? Did you find Mr. Murdoch? No, Al is looking for him. Look, honey, why don't you give up this idea of making extra money? Come home. Nobody wants expensive gifts. No, Jane, I'm determined to make good. I think I'll go back to the woman's wear department. You've already been in the woman's wear department? Yes. How long? Five minutes. <laughs> You see, my first customer bought a raincoat and wanted to know if it was waterproof, so I turned the fire hose on her. <laughs> they, they caught her on the third floor. Hi, <laughs> chicken. Hello, everybody. Oh, Al, did you find Silas Murdoch and give him the summons? Chicken, that guy has moved around more than you have. I've given up. Al, tell her you're not counting on an expensive gift from her. Al, are you listening? Tell Irma you don't want an expensive present from her. I can't hear a thing you're saying, Jane. <laughs> Why not? There's a ringing in my ear. Yeah, the sound of patrol wagons seem to stay with you. Look, Irma, I love you. I don't want to see you kill yourself over nothing. Now I'm going home. Are you coming with me? I will join you, my dear. Hey, what about me? What about you? Aren't you going to walk me home, too? Only if you promise not to sing. It takes two. Please, no, 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 no. Thanks, Jane, but I can't. You run along home now. Okay, you stay here, stay here with Wonder Boy then. Bye. Well, chicken, we're all alone. Why don't you let me take you home? No, Al, I'm going to see this thing through to the finish. I want to know why everybody fires me. Well, didn't they give you a reason? Yes, but I can't hear what they're saying while they're throwing me through the door. So I'm going to go see the president of this store. Chicken, don't get drastic. Al, I'm a woman of action. Where's his office? It's right down there. Two hours left and uh, one hour right. Thanks, Al. Goodbye. You better give me the summons back, uh, Mr. Mr. Clyde. Give this summons back to Mr. Clyde. I will. Bye. Okay, goodbye. Now don't forget, two aisles left and one aisle right. Now, did he say two aisles right and one aisle left, or two aisles left and one aisle right? Oh, this must be it, this long line. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Gee, the boss must be happy, but I can't understand why they're hiring so many children. They must mm -hmm. be short of help. I'll just get in line. Miss, what are you doing in this line? I'm waiting to see the boss. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to get out of this line, you see. Mr. Brown? Yes, Miss Wilkins? The personnel department sent me over. Do you want me to take over? Yes, I've got to get rid of this Santa Claus. Where did you get him? Personnel sent him. His name is Silas Murdoch. Silas Murdoch? I'm going to throw him out. Now you, miss, will you please get out of line? Why? This is the Santa Claus line for children. Well, I'm a child. You? Why, you're as big as I am. Yes, our whole family was overfed. Please, I've got to get to Santa Claus. Can't you see? Santa is waiting for me. I'm coming, Santa. Well, well, well. Why, well, you're a big girl. You want to kiss Santa? All right. Kids aren't what they used to be when I was young. Now, uh, sit on my lap and tell Santa what you want. All right. I want a bicycle, a doll, and a yo-yo. How okay. will you know where to deliver it? Well, Santa knows everything. Well, you may forget my address. Here it is. Uh, let me see. 
The state of New York versus Silas Murdoch. Merry Christmas, oh, no. Santa Claus. Uh. <laughs> Survivor, a modern radio program. You might well ask, how could a radio program such as this survive in our world today? In a word, Garrison Keeler. Well, who's that? Why, he's one of those dreamers among us who was an English major back in the day with no real lucrative career prospects. So what becomes of a young Bachelor of Arts whose resume reads, one, a strong sentimental streak for America, two, a hefty sense of nostalgia, three, close observer of people, the situations they become embroiled in, and characters who transcend time. Thanks to the public broadcasting system, PBS, and your donor dollars, we have the Prairie Home Companion. It's a spot where that same Garrison Keeler has put that English degree to work for the survival of radio drama. All over the country, weekend listeners are treated to the characters he has created for modern radio, stirring timeless human nature into contemporary zaniness. So, can we sample this alchemy? Why, yes. Without further ado, from Prairie Home Companion 2012, let's pop into a homely domestic scene featuring the young millennial Duane, his neurotic mom, and his peacekeeping dad, presenting Garrison Keillor's mom. Hello. Hi, Mom. Wait. It's me. Is that you? How are you? Oh, my goodness. Honey, are you okay? You're not sick, are you? I'm fine, Mom. You're not in the hospital, are you? Mom, I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. <laughs> oh, well, gosh, honey. You scared the living daylights out of me, calling me up out of the nowhere like that. Whoosh, my heart is just pounding like a jackrabbit. <laughs> I just called to see if the thing came for Dad. The thing? What thing? I sent Dad a gift for Father's Day. You should have gotten there yesterday. Just wanted to see if you got it, that's all. Oh, was that from you? I sent a gift, yes. Why? Well, I had no idea you were going to do that. Well, what was it? It was a remotely controlled helicopter. Why? Honey, you should have warned us it was coming. How are we supposed to know? It was a surprise. My name was on it. Well, I couldn't see that. What happened? Well, what did you do with it? I was all alone, Dwayne. Your dad was off fishing. And there, there I was, alone. And then this strange man in a brown uniform left something on the doorstep. It was UPS, Mom. <laughs> well, That's really, their uniform. I didn't know that, and I wasn't expecting anything. And then there's, here's this guy with this package, and it looks suspicious to me. So I called the cops. You did. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, you bring those dogs. And they did. And the dog sniffed, and then he sat down. And so the, spa, the, spa, the, go, the bomb squad came on over, and they blew it up. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, the dog sat down, Dwayne. And that's a signal that he sniffs something wrong. Mom, you don't. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Maybe he was just doing that little scooty thing that doggies do you know, <laughs> when they itch. They blew up the package that said Happy Father's Day from Dwayne? They vaporized it, yes. Oh, 
And then there was a SWAT team here. Oh, and a helicopter overhead, and men in black behind the tree. Oh, and then they blocked off the streets, and they took me over to the neighbors and made everybody lie face <laughs> down upon the floor, and they blew it up, and there was wires sticking out everywhere, and the people were sobbing, and now they're trying to track down whoever sent it, Twain. <laughs> that was me. I paid $275 for that, Mom. Well, la di da uh, Did you get insurance? No. Well, don't blame me. You should always get insurance, Dwayne. Always. No, but crying out loud. Oh, well, they take these threats for you. Anyway, Homeland Security is looking into it, so do not be surprised if you get a phone call. Oh, boy. Yeah, they take these threats very seriously, you know. It wasn't a threat, it well, was a gift. It was all wrapped up, so how are we to know? It could have been a bomb, it could have been anthrax. Oh, it could have been a human hand. It was wrapped because it was a gift. Well, it was suspicious. Oh. You want me to send gifts in saran wrap? Oh, now, don't you get smart with me, Dwayne. I'm not getting smart. You're blaming me, Dwayne, and I don't have to take it. You call the cops every time someone delivers a package to your door? I was alone here, and I do not appreciate your tone. Mom, I was don't... going to go, go sit here and then listen to you point the finger at every time anything goes bad that has ever badly happened in your life. I just won't. Uh, what are you going to do? Call oh. the police? Okay, that's it. I am done with you, Dwayne. I am just done. Hank! Hank! Hank, there's somebody on the phone here for you. It's a stranger, that's who. Mom! Just take the phone, Hank, here. Just, just take it. Just, just take it. I do not want to get it away from me. Hello? Hi, Dad. It's me, Dwayne. Happy Father's Day. Oh, yeah. You're right. How are you doing? Not so bad. Sorry your Father's Day gift got blown up by the bomb squad. Oh well, these things happen. It was a remotely controlled helicopter. I thought you'd have fun with it. Yeah, sounds good. How are you? I can get you another one if you want. I can... Oh no, that's okay. Better not. Are you sure? Yeah, you know your mother. Yes, I do. Speaking of which, here she is. I'll give her back to you. Okay. <laughs> nice talking to you, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. Dwayne, honey, are you still there? I'm here, Mom. Well, honey, I just feel all terrible. It's my fault. I wet your widow gift, and now you hate me, and I understand. Mom, I'm over it. No, you Dad hate me. Dad doesn't care. No, 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 you hate me, and I can hear it in your voice, and that's okay, because I richly deserved all the contempt that you can pile upon my widow plate. So, you just load it on like a big mountain of mashed potatoes. Yeah, the mashed potatoes of hate. Mom, please don't continue that. Oh, Mom, a night for a night, Dwayne. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to strap on a knapsack full of explosives. <laughs> okay? Mom? No, I'll get about stick 15 sticks of dynamite, and then on the 4th of July, I'll strap it all to my chest, and I'm going to walk over to that park and sit down under the oak tree and hook up the detonator to my cell phone, the cell phone that I got, so you could always reach me if you're in trouble, the cell phone that only you, Dwayne, have the number. And then I'll wait for you to call up, and when you do, beep, 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 and it starts to ring, and on the third ring, boom, you will blow me away, Dwayne. Just light up the sky with the human fireworks, honey, the fireworks of your mother. <laughs> then you will be free, Dwayne, free, I tell you. Independence Day, Dwayne, because it is all about you. <laughs> Mom? What? Are you finished? Yeah, I'll read you out another check, Dwayne, if it's the last act in my life. It's okay. Oh, wait, but before we do, let's go out for some ice cream. Well, I shouldn't. I'm really busy. Oh, no, let's have a little root beer float. Maybe an ice cream app. Oh, you know what? You used to love pistachio. 
What time are you coming over? Right now, so put your pants on, Dwayne, because here comes your mama. My pants are on. Sure they are. I'll be over in about three minutes, Dwayne. Bye, honey. Love you. Love you, mom. <laughs> Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. Well, over the years, our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High, has had more than her share of difficulties with her principal, Mr. Conklin. Recently, however, their relations have improved. Things have been a bit smoother between Mr. Conklin and me. In fact, when I suggested the plan I had heard about to supplement our teaching with movies, Mr. Conklin gave me the money to try it out. So until last week, when the great experiment was to take place in one of my classes, everything was going over beautifully and in more ways than one, because Thursday morning, Mr. Boynton was over at my house for breakfast. I could sense that Mr. Boynton felt the warm, romantic, implications of this domestic scene because his voice seemed choked with emotion when he said i wonder how long joe palooka will be champ <laughs> i haven't the slightest idea why don't you ask little abner <laughs> he's been staring at me from the other side of the newspaper for the past 10 minutes oh oh pardon me miss brooks reading the paper was rather rude i guess it's just i feel so at home here I didn't think you'd mind. Oh, I really don't, Mr. Boynton. That's just the way I want you to feel. Good. Oh, I haven't had this sort of breakfast since I was home with Mother. Well, have you ever thought that you might enjoy a breakfast like this every day, Mr. Boynton? Of course I have, Miss Brooks, many times. But Dad needs her too much for Mom to come down here. That isn't <laughs> quite what I had in mind. How's your latest project at school working out, Miss Brooks? The first film, The Lady of the Lake, was shown to my English class yesterday. I had to do something for Mr. Conklin during the hour, so I let the kids run the picture themselves. We'll know how it was received when Walter Denton picks us up in a few minutes. Well, films can be a big help to all teachers. I wonder why Mr. Conklin would never allow it at Madison before. He hates popcorn. Miss Davis is very fond of the idea, though. In fact, she's showing a film at her club breakfast this morning. She rented it from the same place I did. Hmm, what picture did she rent? Oh, a little number called Shearing Sheep at Big Billabong, Australia. Oh, what's it all about? It's about shearing sheep at Big Billabong, Australia. It's perfect for the ladies in Miss Davis's club. Well, why? There's some pretty wooly ladies in Mrs. <laughs> Davis's club. Oh, that must be Walter. Come on in, the door's open. Well, what a pleasant surprise. Greetings to my two favorite faculty members. Hi, Walter. Hey, where's the effervescent Mrs. Davis this morning? She's fizzing at the ladies' club breakfast. Oh, that must be the same one Mom and Mrs. Conklin are attending. Walter, we are both anxious to hear about that audiovisual experiment worked out yesterday. Oh, great. Unfortunately, the sound part of the projector didn't work, but the class made up for that. Oh, you never heard such whistling in all your life. Whistling? That lady at the lake? Well, the title on the can the picture came and said, The Lady of the Lake, all right. But the picture turned out to be something called Sirens of the Screen, Past and Present. What? Yeah, it was run at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and every fellow in the class was late for dinner that night. But it's only a 15-minute short. I know, but we ran it 23 times. <laughs> and we stopped the projector for 10 minutes every time we got to Marilyn Monroe. Has Mr. Conklin heard about this yet, Walter? I don't know, Miss Brooks. I hope he hasn't. I know what this project means to you, Miss Brooks. Well, cheer up, Mr. Boynton. Even if he has heard about it, we can still get a picture of the Lady of the Lake. What do you mean? I may drown myself. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, if you'll be seated, Ms. Brooks, I'll come directly to the point. Yes, sir. As an experiment in audiovisual education, I gave you not only permission, but also $15 to rent a projector and a film of the poem, The Lady of the Lake. Something go wrong, Mr. Conklin? Miss Brooks, when I did so, I had no idea that the Lady of the Lake would turn out to be Marilyn Monroe. Me either. Esther Williams would have been much more appropriate. I mean, I can explain, Mr. Conklin. Explain? Explain this, then. When you wanted this film, you told me it's a Walter Scott's poem presented against a background of Scotch scenes. Oh, but, sir... The only Scotch in that picture, entire picture, was a glass in Theodore Barra's hand. Oh! <laughs> then you've run the picture, Mr. Conklin. Five times, Miss, uh, uh, yeah, I ran it through a few times to convince myself that what I was seeing was true. Sirens of the screen indeed. I've already heard from Mr. Stone this morning, and he was furious. Mr. Conklin, there is a mistake on the part of the company. Institutional pictures. I told Mr. Stone it was all a mistake, and I also told him we had another film in case he wanted to reassure himself on the subject matter of the pictures we're showing. But, sir... We haven't another picture. And including a projector, they cost $15 to rent. That is your problem, Miss Brooks. You got us into this thing, and you're going to get us out of it. In any event, Mr. Stone said he wouldn't bother to come over unless there are further complaints. However, if there are, heads would roll. Oscar Conklin, principal speaking. Who? Yes, she's right here. It's for you, Miss Brooks. Hello? Hello, Connie. This is Mrs. Davis. Oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. I just called to tell you how the picture I showed at the Ladies' Club breakfast they turned out. I give full credit to the idea of you, of course, and I told the ladies that this was the identical sort of picture being shown at Madison High. I see. Well, how did shearing sheep at Big Billabong turn out? Oh, those scenes in the nightclub were terrific, dear. <laughs> nightclub? Yes, and the ones that the sh in the showgirls' dressing room are even more sensational. Well, where were the sheep? You know, that's what I was wondering, too. I ran the picture through three times trying to find them. But it was all about a chorus girl. However, none of the ladies seemed to mind. That is none except Mrs. Stone. Mrs. Stone was there? What did she say, Mrs. Davis? She didn't say a thing. She just fainted. I hope I haven't disturbed you, dear. Oh, uh, oh no, not at all, Mrs. Davis. Well, I'll speak to you later. Goodbye. Bye, dear. And what was that all about, Miss Brooks? Mr. Conklin, did Mr. Stone really say heads would roll if there was another complaint? That's exactly what he said, Miss Brooks. I wonder how we'll both look ten inches shorter. <laughs> I told Mr. Boynton about my predicament in the school cafeteria at lunchtime. Now, let's see if I've got it straight, Miss Brooks. You must have another film here to show Mr. Stone when he arrives this afternoon or the entire project goes right out of the window. Followed swiftly by me, and the cost of renting a new film and projector is $15, which I've got to find somewhere. Well, you can count on me for part of the $15. Oh, really, Mr. Boynton? What part? $2.35. <laughs> oh, uh, here's the 35 cents now. Well, thanks, Mr. Boynton, but where are the $2? Uh, just a second until I take off my shoe. You mean you've got $2 in your shoe? Well, no, I've only got $1 in my shoe. Where's the other dollar? In my hat band. You'd make a nervous wreck out of a hold-up man. I do appreciate this. Hi, Miss Brooks. Oh, Mr. hello, Harriet. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. What is it, Harriet? Well, first, Daddy asked me to tell you to be sure to be in his office with the new film by 3.30, because that's when Mr. Stone is due to arrive. And secondly, knowing the position you're in, I went around to all the girls and took up a collection for you. I knew you needed $15, so I canvassed about 30 girls. Miss Brooks, I told them to cough up as much as they could. How much did you collect? 80 cents. <laughs> That's not much of a cough. I've also got a dollar of my own I want to lend Oh, no, 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 really, Harriet. I don't, wouldn't dream of taking your money. Oh, but Miss Brooks... Well, all right, dear, if you insist. 
Where's the dollar? I'll give it to you as soon as I go down to my locker after lunch. The dollar's in your locker. Not exactly, Miss Brooks. But that's the only place I can remove the stocking I'm wearing over it. If the wallet industry depended on this school, it'd go broke. Here's some money, Miss Brooks. I did the very best I could. Did you take up a collection too, Walter? Oh, yes, sir. I went around to all the fellas in your English Lit class, Miss Brooks, and since they'd seen the sirens of the screen, this was one little way of expressing their gratitude. Oh, and how much did you collect? Fifty-five cents. I could have done bigger business with the Lady of the Lake. Oh, but that's not all. I want to lend you a dollar of my own, which I've kept for just such an emergency. Thanks, Walter. Where is it? Well, you know that good luck charm I wear around my neck with my mother's picture in it? Yes. Well, that's not my mother. It's George Washington. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, there was more to you people than meets the eye. Now, let's see. That comes to approximately six dollars. I've got another couple of dollars of my own. Well, I didn't think you had any money, Miss Brooks. Where did you get two dollars? Remember when I went to the dentist last week? Yes. Well, I stashed two dollars in a temporary filling. <laughs> oh, I'm dreadfully sorry, Miss Brooks, but institutional pictures can't accept eight dollars for a projector and film, which runs for fifteen. But, Mr. Gibson, it was your mistake in the first place. You sent us sirens of the screens, past and present, when I ordered Lady of the Lake from your salesman. I think his name was Blake. Oh, yes. We've had nothing but trouble with that man. Our manager wouldn't raise his salary so out of sheer spite. He switched any number of films on us before he quit. I'd like to help you, but we have a strict 24-hour ruling, and you've had your film for several days. You'll just have to tell your... Or by the way, what is your organization? A ladies' club, a social service group, a union? I teach at Madison High. You d What? Why, our biggest rental is to schools. You showed sirens of the screen to a high school class? With a 10-minute stopover at Marilyn Monroe. Look, look, you look like a very fair-minded person. I will tell you what I'll do. You keep the $8 and have a new film and projector for nothing. Well... Oh, I'll make it four films for nothing. Well, well oh, forget about the films. Forget about the rentals entirely. I will give you a year's supply of films for free if you'll get your school to forget about the scandal. Well... Well, and I'll throw in $10 for yourself. Well... Oh, Miss Brooks, aren't you going to answer me? I'm doing good enough with well. <laughs> now look, Mr. Gibson, just give me a good film to show the head of our school board when he comes to Madison this afternoon, and we'll call it square. Oh, you are the salt of the earth. I have just the thing for the occasion, the Board of Education at work. Don't you think it's perfect? I suppose so, if you like fantasy. <laughs> well... When Mr. Gibson agreed to rectify his mistake and give me a new film to show, Mr. Stone, it seemed that my troubles were just about over. At three that afternoon, we were getting ready and had everything ready in Mr. Conklin's office. Well, the projector's all set up, Miss Brooks. All we have to do when Mr. Conklin and Mr. Stone get here is turn the switch and run the film. Yeah, and this office ought to be a perfect projection room. We've still got a few minutes before Daddy gets here. Why don't we run the film through once for the four of us? Good idea, Harriet. Let's sit down. All right, Walter. Turn off the desk light and get started. Yes, ma'am. There we are. Well, we've missed the title, but we know it's about the Board of Education at work. Well, look at that sign by the side of the road. Yes, it says... You are now entering Las Vegas, Nevada? <laughs> oh, it's probably all about the Las Vegas Board of Education. I hope you're right. Of course I am. There they are now, all walking around a table. They certainly are. A dice table, Mr. Boynton. Uh. This is a picture about gambling. There has been another terrible mistake. Turn off the projector at once, Miss Brooks. Well, I'm trying to. The switch is stuck. Pull the plug out of the wall. I don't know where the wall plug is with the lights off. Walter, turn on the desk lamp so Mr. Boynton can find the plug. Walter! Walter, do you hear me? You're a big help. You have to find it in the dark, Mr. Boynton. Well, I'll try. 
Oh, good. You found it. <laughs> what on earth is going on here? Uh, Mr. Coughlin? Oh, just a moment, sir. I'll turn on the lights. No, no, no. Never mind the lights, Miss Brooks. Since you've apparently started your new film, The Board of Education at Work, I'd like to have a look at it before Mr. Stone gets here. Um, er, here, sir. Sit, please, sit in my chair. Where will you sit? I'll stand in front of the screen. It isn't a very good picture, Mr. Conklin. Stop, stop babbling, please. I'll just settle myself in this comfortable chair. Here we are. Ah, Egad, something speared me. You just sat on my knees, Daddy. And you're a little heavy. Harriet. I doubt if I can hold a bolt of you. Denton, turn on those wall lights, Boynton. Yes, sir. Aha, Harriet. I want you and Denton to leave this room at once. I'll speak to you both later. Very well. Mr. Conklin, appearances are very often deceiving, and I want you to know that Harry was in no way responsible for what happened. I'll take the full blame, sir. Outside. Was my... Yes, sir. Goodbye. Well, Mr. Stone ought to be here any minute. We can get rolling again. At least our heads can. <laughs> Mr. Conklin, I... Come in. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Stone. Good afternoon, Osgood. Uh, Ms. Boynton, Ms. Brooks. Hello, Mr. Stone. Want to go for a nice walk? A walk? I came over here to see a movie. That's what I mean. Let's go over and see a movie. The Bijou is fine Marilyn Brando picture. Miss Brooks, what are you jabbering about now? Now turn off the lights, Boynton, and I'll put a, I'll put the plug back on the wall. If you say so, Mr. Conklin. Yes. Ah, there you are, Mr. Stone. What a scene. The members of the Board of Education gather around at the table rolling dice. Now, it's certainly a far cry from the report you heard about the picture yesterday with a shocking exhibition of movie queen. And, and Miss Brooks, why are the members of the Board rolling dice? Blackjack dealers are on strike. <laughs> All right, look, I'm turning the lights on. I uh, see, my, my suspicions, suspicions were true. Your, your moral laxity is undermining its entire uh, institution. I'm so sorry. Pardon this interruption, Miss Brooks, but there's been another mistake. Now, who tells me? Who is this man? It's Mr. Gibson, the man who rented us the film. I'll do anything to rectify my mistakes, Miss Brooks, while I'll... Oh, hello, Mr. Stone. Oh, you know Mr. Stone? Uh, 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 he evidently is mistaking me for somebody else. No, oh, no, 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 sir. Don't you remember when that friend of yours got married last month and you rented two films from me for a smoker that you gave him? I remember it distinctly because one of the pictures caused all of the hubbub today. The sirens of the screen, past and present. Oh, is, is that so? I, well, for your information, when I finished it on the screen, uh, that night, it turned out to be Lady of the Lake. So, Mr. Stone, are you going to call my moral laxity to the attention of the board? Uh, well, uh, I, I really didn't mean that. Uh, did, 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 do you, Osgood? You wouldn't think I would. If anything, uh, it's Mr. Gibson who should be brought before the board. Oh, that would be a waste of time, Mr. Stone. A waste of time? The way Mr. Gibson operates, by the time he got there, he'd turn in to be judge out of the board. <laughs> Next week, at the same time and over the same station, Eve Arden, in the role of, of Madison High School's favorite English teacher, Miss Brooks, will again call the student body together. Don't you be absent. <laughs> night in a city that knows how to keep its secrets. But on the 12th floor of the Acme building, one man is still trying to find the answers to life's persistent questions. Guy Noir, private eye. It was April and I was in New York investigating a suspicious subprime collateralized investment vehicle, the derivative swap. What is that? It belongs to my ex-girlfriend, Sybil, who I am suing for custody of our puggle. What's that? Our dog. It's a pug beagle mix. A puggle. Its name is Wiggles, and I'm suing Sybil because she plays under the double eagle on a bugle, and Wiggles struggles to get loose, and I'm afraid the seagull is going to strangle her. <laughs> what seagull? 
Sybil keeps an illegal seagull in her condo and feeds it bagels, which gives the beetle a fungal intestinal infection. <laughs> So, so I was sitting in a cafe in the West Village where Sybil always came in for her, cafe, her coffee. I was sitting at the counter trying to ignore the guy next to me who, like so many New Yorkers, was carrying on a phone conversation for trying to attract the larger audience. Anyway, you're angry at me because they're paying $4,000 a month for the very same apartment that I'm paying $500 a month, and mine is one floor above them. They're paying eight times what I'm paying. Hey, I got one word for you. Deal with it. Excuse me, mister? Excuse me, Glenny. One minute. Yeah? Are you almost done with your conversation? Who died and made you superintendent of public conversations, mister? At least you gotta <laughs> keep your voice down. This is down. This is down. You want to hear up? Huh, do you? Get two feet away from me talking on the phone. It's like a yelling at somebody on top of the building. You don't like it? Move, huh? Find your own cafe, a cafe of silence. Just button it up, would you? Joey, can it? You want some coffee, mister? You take it outside or else shut up! What's everybody picking on me for? I mean it. Put a lid on it or out you go. I threw you out once. I can do it again. No cell phones in here. You know that. Come on. It's a dumb rule. Oh, don't push me. Understand? Do not push me. I am a soprano. You can mess with a mezzo, but you jerk me around and you are going to wind up with a poison cup of coffee and I'm not kidding, so scram. All right, okay, okay, okay. Hey, you're an eight Renata Flambe, aren't you? We met a couple of years ago. I was up in your mansion on Fifth Avenue and took care of those evil dwarves. Oh, yeah. Noir is the name. Guy Noir. Oh, yeah, right. You don't remember me, do you? No. I was there protecting you from a horde of fans who were trying to get over your moat and up the drawbridge and steal souvenirs from your music room and solarium. Oh, yeah, right. So what are you doing waitressing in a coffee shop? You doing research for roles in streetcar named desire? No, I'm earning money to pay my rent. Rent? I lost the mansion and I'm living in Queens. You in Queens? What happened? I produced an opera. What? <laughs> A new opera called Titanic. Oh, boy. <laughs> we performed it in New York Harbor on a real ship. What happened? The set sank. <laughs> Wasn't that in the script? Well, in Act 4, but it sank in Act 1. <laughs> oh, boy, what happened? Well, an airliner landed in the Hudson. Another one? And we turned to avoid it, and the ship rolled over, so we had to refund all the ticket money. Where was the audience? It was a Cinecast closed circuit. A million people sitting in 2,500 theaters all around the country and in Europe. Anyway, I lost everything. How so? I paid for the whole production. Oh, no. I thought it was going to be huge. Mortgage my house on Fifth Avenue. Mortgage my house in the Bahamas. The house in Aspen, the apartment in Paris, the ranch in Wyoming, the yacht, the jet, it's all gone. Sold my furs, my paintings, and I'm still three million in debt. That's horrible. Oh, well, when you've been Mimi and Carmen and Tosca and Violetta, you're grateful just to be alive. So here I am. Care for some more coffee? I guess. I'm really sorry, Miss Lambe. Oh, no big deal. Life goes on. Triple latte! You, uh, you want a sandwich or anything? You seem awfully calm about having lost everything. Oh, God. Hey, everything comes in to an end. Enjoy it while you got it, and when it's gone, say goodbye. Hey, 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 Renata, sweetheart. Have I got good news for you? Who is he? Friend of mine. Well, hi there. Listen to this. Have I got a plan? Yes, I have got a plan. We are going to get you on top in six months. Six months, you're going to be bigger than ever. Big, big. Okay, listen to me. 
we gotta start small. Were you doing some spots on the Charbet channel? Selling foot necklaces, they're very big now. It's a way to get visibility. Then we're gonna move to the home improvement channel. You'll do some carpentry work and get this, you can sing like a hammer and nails. And then I've got you a possible gig doing the national anthem in Philadelphia for a Phillies game in August. And that's not all. Louise, listen, it's nice of you, but no thanks. No thanks? What do you mean, no thanks? I'm your agent. I'm your best friend. I'm going to get you back on top. <clears throat> Don't want to be back on top. Look, I caught you on a bad day. I'll be back. I'll send you an email. Listen, sweetheart, I've got to run. Okay, take care. They'll come back to you. I'm happy. I don't miss the house. Oh, maybe a little. But life is good. Oh, my life used to be so dreamy when I was there on Fifth Avenue. Astoria is where I live now in a fourth floor walk up. Not far from LaGuardia. You can still sing, Miss Wombe. You ought to get back in the opera. Tired of it. Done with it. Standing on a huge stage with some little man with bad breath, <laughs> wrapping his arms around me and screeching in my ear. So what are you going to do? I got an offer to sing at a Unitarian church in New York. All Souls Unitarian Church. I like Unitarians. It's a little odd hearing people pray to whom it may concern. <laughs> but they're good people, not good singers, because they're busy reading ahead to see if they agree with the words. <laughs> and there are no soloists. Everybody takes turns. But the coffee lasts three times as long as the service. And there are 124 recovery programs and support groups that meet every week. So you really get to know people. Right. Asking questions is no sin. If you're Unitarian, who am I? What do I know? When I die, where do I go? We're square pegs in oval holes. Glad to have you at all souls. Lots of questions do we see. Several hundred every week. What to do to make world peace? Who are you? Is that your peace? Peace and justice are our goals. Glad to have you have all souls. Hey, look on Craigslist. You gotta go on and keep looking every ten minutes. <laughs> I saw a two-bedroom in Murray Hill for 900 a month. <coughs> Needs remodeling, but it's worth checking out. But remember, the asking price is only a starting point. You gotta negotiate. Hey, you. Me? Out. Why? Out. What do I do? Out. Okay, I'm off the phone. Out. Okay. No, no, no! Ow! <laughs> what do I owe you for the latte? It's on the house. Thanks for listening. Good luck to you. I didn't know Unitarians threw people through glass doors, though. <laughs> he was wearing a t-shirt that said WWJD, and that's what Jesus would have done. Throw him through the door. Maybe he was Unitarian. Maybe the shirt meant what would Jefferson do? Jefferson would have thrown him through the door, too. How's your coffee? Fine. You want a cookie with that? I just made some gingerbread pisons. Sure, why not? <laughs> a dark night in a city that knows how to keep its secrets. But on the 12th floor of the Acme building, one man is trying to find the answers to life's persistent questions. Guy Noir, 
private eye. Have you been writing to a grown man? Have you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, where did you meet this man? I didn't meet him yet. Well, how did you get in touch with him? You don't just sit down out of thin air and write a letter to occupant, elevator number three, Des Moines City Hall. No, you write to the Lonely Hearts Club. Oh, God. Oh, I had to open my big mouth. It's all my fault. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let me see what you two find to talk about. My precious darling. Precious darling? That's me. Oh, goodness. 
I received your last loving letter, and I'm sorry to hear that you're working so hard in your new show. New show? Snooks, have you been telling this man things that aren't true? What does he think you are? The darling of cafe society. <laughs> Where did you get an idea like that? From a magazine story. Oh, I realize I can't realize I can't expect you to sit home nights waiting for me, and I, I don't mind a few casual friends, but who is this Tommy Manville you mentioned? It, Snooks. It was in the magazine. And is this going to end? I don't know. I ain't finished the story yet. Well, you better finish it in a hurry. I can't. Why not? I tore out the last page to make spitballs. <laughs> oh, Snooks, this is ridiculous. You with a grown-up boyfriend. Yeah. I'm the only girl in school who has one. Snooks, I want you to stop writing to this man. I won't do it. But the whole thing is absurd. I won't. I won't. I won't do it. Uh, of course, I could have insisted she stop writing to him, Vera. But that would have made a hero out of him. And out of him, Snooks would have liked him that much more. Well, you're not going to let it go on, are you? Oh, don't worry. I have a perfect plan. I'll get her interested in some nice kid her own age, but she'll forget all about that old codger. Well, that may not be as easy as it sounds. Oh, I'll manage. I invited ten of the nicest boys in town to drop over tonight. Good heavens, Lancelot. Oh, don't worry. Not all of them can make it. Well, how many are coming? Uh, one. <laughs> oh, who is he? Timmy O'Brien. His, uh, his father works in our shipping department. Hello, Daddy. Oh, hello, Snooks. I've got a big surprise for you. Wait till you hear who's coming over to see you tonight. Who? Timmy O'Brien. I never heard of him. Oh, well, just wait till he flashes that big Irish smile at you. You'll melt. He's got the cutest grin and even white teeth. Oh, those teeth. I've never seen anything to compare with them. You like him, Daddy? I certainly do. Then you go out with him. <laughs> Why, he sounds wonderful, Snooks. I may go out with him myself. Have a good time. Mm. Well, that must be Timmy now. I'll open it. Beer, will you see this kid smile? Well... Timmy O'Brien, come right in, Timmy. Snooks is waiting for you. I am not. Oh, Snooks, say hello to Timmy. Hello, Timmy. Hello, Snooks. <laughs> what did he say? I said hello, Snooks. Timmy, what happened to your mouth, your teeth? He ain't coming. Are you sure this is the right boy, Lancelot? All his front teeth are missing? Oh, this is unbelievable. Only yesterday he threw a beautiful, gleaming, white smile at me. Well, maybe he threw it at somebody else and it didn't ever come back. <laughs> well, I'll go fix the candy. Good luck, Mr. Matchmaker. Uh -huh. oh, well. Isn't this chummy? Just the three of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what they say. Three's a crowd. Maybe there's one too many here, huh? Yeah, I'll leave. Come back here. We'll all stay. All right. Well, go ahead, Snooks. Uh, talk to Timmy. I don't like him, Daddy. He's a wonderful boy. Oh, he's doing a book of me. How can you say a thing like that? He's an athlete, a football hero. Ah, uh, Mr. Higgins. <laughs> yes, sir. I can see him now. He's got the ball. He eludes one tackle and then another. There he goes. What a runner. He's all over the field. So it's his teeth. <laughs> oh, what's the use? I won't always be like this, Dukes. When I get my new taste, will you go out for something? I'm sorry, Timmy, but I'm true to Albert. Forget it, Albert. You're going out with Timmy. I am not. You are, too. I am not. I'll tell Albert on you. Albert Schmelbert. Now listen, 
I'm your father, and you do as I say. Now, where are you going? I'm going to write to Albert, and he'll take me away from all this in his elevator. You know, these brisk days make me wish I was a kid again, but then I guess I am at heart. That, that is when it comes to jello. The one and only jello of gelatin dessert. Look for the big letters in the box. They spell jello, and jello spells a treat. J E L L O! Now back to Sycamore Terrace. Snooks wrote a letter to a middle aged Lonely Hearts correspondent, Albert Potter, begging him to come and carry her away from her tyrannical father. It's one week later, and Snooks is up in her room with her little friend, Isabel. Why did you ask me to come here tonight, Snooks? I want my daddy to think you're up here helping me with my homework. You want me to help you with your homework? No. Do you want to know a secret, Isabel? I... Look at this letter. Here, let me see. Hey, 
that you took your hands off first. So. What? Timmy? Put up your dukes, mister. If you want took you off to fight me good. Fight your fist. Are you making fun of the way I speak? No, thank you, son. And I hope you'll both be happy. Goodbye. Are you all right, sister? Yeah. I hope you ain't mad at me at what I did. No. You saved me from that awful Albert. <laughs> awful? I thought he was a book friend. No. You're my hero. <coughs> Gosh, I am? Yeah. Couldn't you tell? Oh, I guess you don't know much about women. Hey, what's uh, what's this ladder? What, what's going on down there? It's all right, Daddy. I'm down here with my boyfriend. Albert? No, Timmy. Oh, Timmy. Well, how do you like that? <laughs> I like it. Well, Smith's better, man. Be sure to listen next week when we'll be back in another great adventure. Until then, remember Jello in those six delicious flavors. Snooks, you tell me. Yes, the taste of tempting Jello, and believe me, you will know it's the one and only J E L L O. <laughs> I like it. From humble beginnings, radio was a phenomenon influencing a whole nation. With electrification reaching even rural backwaters like the Tennessee Valley, the number of radios in America grew from 12 million in 1930 to 40 million in 1948. The number of radio stations rose from 696 in 1929 to 919 in 1945. Going into the 1950s, over 60% of American homes had a radio. Every family was tuned in. It became the common denominator of American life. The radio provided a window on the world for a whole nation. And why? The nation was struggling with its identity. The nation wanted a more glamorous reality. The nation wanted to eavesdrop on the dramas in other people's lives. But just as much, the nation craved an opportunity to laugh together. And so, we tuned in, and those disembodied voices, some from vaudeville, some from nowhere, became the nation's darlings, became the nation's habit. Thank you for tuning into our radio program today. We hope you enjoyed taking the journey with us, revisiting and reappreciating the radio of the past and shining a new light on the radio of the present. This has been a production of Miracosta College NCPSY 13, The Impact of Radio on Our Lives. We'd like, to, uh, we'd like to ask you all to remain seated for a presentation.
She's been a joy to work with. Just as good as Sherry. Oh. <laughs> Highly qualified. And we wanted to show her our appreciation from the class of 2015. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's give one more round of applause for our lovely cast and all of their hard work. Good food over there.